police in the United States brutalize and kill so many civilians that I suspect most communities have a story like the one I'm about to tell you. This story takes place in Hagerstown, which is where I live, in September of 2016. It's about a 15-year-old girl who collided with a car while riding her bike. The exact details of the collision differ depending on whose story you believe. The driver of the car told police the teenager hit the side of his car with her bike, while the teenager's attorney said the car hit her, causing her to flip, knocking her unconscious. She was eventually taken to the hospital, where, according to news reports, she was diagnosed with a possible concussion and other injuries, which I think tends to support her attorney's version of the story, but who knows. What happened next is a bit clearer because much of it was captured on video recorded by bystanders as well as police body cams. Hagerstown City Police arrived on the scene where the teenager was being less than cooperative. She tried to leave. She argued with the cops. She yelled. All of this is completely understandable from my point of view. She'd just been in an accident. She had a possible head injury. She was surrounded by cops, and oh yeah, in case I didn't mention it, she was 15. The cops, of course, didn't see it this way. They detained her, handcuffing her and shoving her into a wall before picking her up, carrying her and dumping her into the back of a police car. Then they pepper sprayed her while she was inside the car, slammed the door shut, and didn't offer her water or allow her to wash her face until she arrived at the police station. She was charged with disorderly conduct, second-degree assault, possession of marijuana, and failure to obey a traffic device, though the charges were eventually dropped. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that the police department fully supported the officers involved and insisted they had acted entirely appropriately when they manhandled and pepper-sprayed the teenager who had just been hit by a car. Now, this story didn't end nearly as badly as have so many other similar stories. While we don't officially know this then 15-year-old girl's name, we do know the names of other young people who have had violent run-ins with the police. We know the names of Tamir Rice, who was 12 when police shot and killed him while he held a toy gun, and Ayanna Jones, who was 7 when she was shot and killed when cops broke into her apartment in an attempt to apprehend a murder suspect who was not there. And just last month, we learned the name of Adam Toledo, who was 13 when he was shot and killed by a Chicago cop after complying with the officer's order to put his hands up. In a country where police typically kill a thousand civilians a year, including many who are unarmed or who are cooperating with police orders or who have done nothing to warrant even the threat of lethal force, much less the use of it, or who are teenagers or children, a kid getting assaulted and pepper sprayed but not killed by cops counts as a happy ending. And that illustrates a big part of the problem with policing in the United States. When cops use lethal force without justification, when they kill civilians who are not armed or not posing a threat or not even suspected of a violent crime, which, I want to be clear, does not describe every police killing of a civilian, those are merely the worst outcomes. There are plenty of incidents, like the one I just told you about, that don't end in a killing, but which we should still regard as examples of absolutely unacceptable policing. Policing in the United States has its own unique problems, problems rooted in its history and in how the job of a police officer and our expectations of what that job entails and how people who do that job relate to the rest of us have evolved over the years. But it also is affected by some of the larger problems that afflict virtually every facet of American society. And among those larger problems, there is perhaps none more harmful and intractable than institutional racism. Though they weren't called police at the time, some of the first organizations to do work which we today would recognize as police work were slave patrols. Beginning in the early 18th century, decades before independence and the drafting of the Constitution, these patrols were organized and tasked with finding runaway slaves and returning them to their owners and putting down slave revolts. While modern police departments didn't grow directly out of these slave patrols, they did inherit the basic assumptions under which the slave patrols operated. 
white supremacy first and foremost, but also the notion that to enforce the law meant to defend the status quo, to serve the interests of the powerful. While police brutality affects everyone, and police kill people of many races and ethnicities, black Americans are three times as likely to be killed by police as whites. Black Americans are also more likely to be killed by police while unarmed. And while black Americans make up only 13% of the total U.S. population, last year, 2020, they accounted for 28% of police killings. As you can see by this chart from the website Mapping Police Violence, Hispanic people are also more likely than whites to be killed by police and to be killed by police while unarmed. Police brutality is a problem for all of us, but it is clearly more of a problem for black and brown people than for white people. And remember, as the story I told at the top of the video illustrates, police brutality consists of more than just police killings. There are also the violent encounters between civilians and police that don't result in a death, as well as the numerous examples we've seen just the past few years of police violently responding to peaceful street protests, not to mention the countless times police have disregarded the constitutional rights of suspects, coerced false confessions, or taken it upon themselves to mete out a bit of quote-unquote justice on their own before a suspect ever sees the inside of a courtroom. So, what do we do about this? What are some practical steps our cities, states, and even the federal government can take to address this problem? You know I'm going to say we need to get in touch with our government representatives about this, but when we do that, we can't just say, hey, do police reform. We need to come at them with specifics. So what specifically should we be pushing our local, state, and federal officials to do? I'm just a dipshit with a YouTube channel, but I'm a dipshit who majored in English in college, so I know a good rhetorical device when I see one. When it comes to police reform, I think we should start with the three Ds. The first D is the one you're probably the most familiar with because it's been a rallying cry ever since the killing of George Floyd almost a year ago. Defund the police. This is not only the most talked about of the three Ds, it's also the most misunderstood. That misunderstanding is due in large part to opponents of police reform, who have intentionally tried to sow confusion by distorting the actual goals of those who support defunding. When most activists propose defunding the police, they aren't calling for police budgets to be zeroed out, and they aren't calling for the wages of police officers to be cut. What they're actually proposing is something that would benefit not only the community as a whole, but the police department as well. That's because simultaneous to the defunding of the police would be a reduction of police responsibilities. In many communities across the country, and I'm talking about big cities and rural areas, the police department is the catch-all agency that responds anytime there's a problem. Sometimes that problem is something that demands the presence of armed law enforcement officers, but sometimes the problem is someone in the midst of a mental health crisis, or people involved in some sort of nonviolent dispute, or some other situation that would not be improved by the arrival of people with guns. By defunding the police, we can afford to fund new agencies that are specifically tasked with responding to those sorts of situations, which will not only improve outcomes for people in those situations, because it's less likely somebody's going to get beat up or shot when the guys who've been trained to beat up and shoot people don't answer the call, but also take those responsibilities off the police department's plate. It's win-win. Not only should reform advocates and ordinary citizens support defunding the police in this way, cops should be all for it too. The biggest reason why they aren't is that police unions reflexively rebel against any proposed measure of police reform, no matter how targeted or reasonable that measure may be. Police unions, like the gun lobby, have a truly destructive amount of influence in American politics. That's unfortunate and makes every effort to push through police reform far more difficult than it ought to be. Fortunately, 
police unions don't actually get to vote on legislation. And if enough of our local, state, and federal lawmakers support reform, including plans to defund the police and redistribute certain funds and responsibilities to other agencies, it doesn't matter what the cop unions think about it. All it takes to defeat powerful lobbying groups like police unions is political will. Of course, most American politicians are weak-willed and cowardly, which is why they need to hear from you. The second of the three Ds is demilitarize the police. This one is the most straightforward of the three Ds. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Since the creation of the Federal Law Enforcement Support Office in the 1990s, the Defense Department has transferred billions of dollars worth of military equipment to civilian police departments. One of the requirements of these transfers is that police departments must use the equipment they receive from the military within one year of receiving it, or else return it. Some of the material distributed to police departments by the LESO is fairly innocuous. Clothing, office supplies, medical supplies, stuff like that. But we're also talking about armored vehicles and military weapons. Demilitarizing the police means not giving those things to police departments anymore. The rationale being that vehicles and weapons designed to be employed by our army against another army during a battle shouldn't be employed by police against civilians. It's kind of a terrible idea that never should have been done in the first place. Oh, and if you're wondering why it was done in the first place, despite being an obviously terrible idea, it was the war on drugs. When Congress first included a program to transfer military hardware from the Defense Department to state and local law enforcement agencies, it was specifically for the purpose of supporting, quote, counter-drug activities. If you've watched the rest of this series, you might remember that the war on drugs is also one of the most significant driving factors behind mass incarceration. So it's just a bad, bad thing all around, the war on drugs. And maybe we should stop it. Giving military vehicles and weapons to police departments isn't just a bad idea in theory. A 2017 study published in the journal Research and Politics found that the more militarized a police department is, the more violent that police department is likely to become. The study found that a police department which received military equipment was more likely to kill civilians than it was before it received the equipment. In a Washington Post article about the study, two of its co-authors put it this way, quote, Militarization makes every problem, even a car of teenagers driving away from a party, look like a nail that should be hit with an AR-15 hammer. So obviously the best way to deal with this problem is to end the transfer of equipment from the Defense Department to civilian law enforcement agencies. That should ultimately be done through legislation. Congress added the LESO to the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, and Congress can remove it and end the program and should. But until that happens, an executive order from the President of the United States could place restrictions on the program that would limit the amount of military hardware that could find its way to the streets of American cities and towns. President Obama issued such an order in 2015, but that order was rolled back by President Trump in 2017 because, of course it was, President Biden could issue his own executive order reimposing the restrictions put in place by Obama's order. I think that would be a good idea. But that's only a stopgap measure. What really needs to happen is for Congress to act, to cancel the LESO program and end the transfer of military vehicles and weapons to police departments altogether. By the way, another study published just last year in the journal Nature Human Behavior looked at police departments that have actually demilitarized, that is, they gave back military equipment they had received through the LESO, and found that demilitarization has little to no impact on the rate of violent crime or officer safety. So there's really no good reason not to do it. The last of the three Ds brings us back around to the problem of white supremacy. The third D is denazify the police. 
White supremacy is deeply embedded in American institutions, in our society, and our collective consciousness. Institutionalized racism exists as a result of unconscious biases, unacknowledged prejudices, double standards and stereotypical thinking and misguided assumptions that we often aren't even aware of. All of that is extremely serious, causes real harm, and needs to be dealt with. But the thing is, there are also avowed, willful white supremacists working as police officers. Like, not just people who have some shitty, ignorant attitudes toward people of color that need to be corrected through counseling and education, but people who are actually members of organized white supremacist groups. A report published last year by the Brennan Center for Justice refers to multiple sources, including internal FBI documents, to establish that law enforcement officials have active links to organized white supremacy. Michael German, author of the Brennan Center report, writes, quote, Since 2000, law enforcement officials with alleged connections to white supremacist groups or far-right militant activities have been exposed in Alabama, California, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, and elsewhere. These officers' racist activities are often known within their departments, but only result in disciplinary action or termination if they trigger public scandals. Explicit white supremacy in law enforcement is nothing new. I mentioned the history of slave patrols already. Beyond that, throughout the 20th century, police officers were frequently members of racist domestic terrorism groups like the Ku Klux Klan. In that aforementioned Brennan Center report, Michael German describes an alarmingly typical example, quote, In the 1980s, the investigation of a KKK firebombing of a black family's home in Kentucky exposed a Jefferson County police officer as a Klan leader. In a deposition, the officer admitted that he directed a 40-member Klan subgroup called the Confederate Officers Patriot Squad, cops, half of whom were police officers. He added that his involvement in the KKK was known to his police department and tolerated so long as he didn't publicize it. For more recent evidence that establishes white supremacists in law enforcement is still very much a problem, look no further than the attack on the United States Capitol on January 6th. The rally of Trump supporters, which led to a mob forcing its way into the Capitol building in an attempt to thwart the certification of the 2020 presidential election result, was attended by no less than 39 law enforcement officers from 17 states, according to a piece by Jonathan Ben Menachem, published on The Appeal. What do we do about it? How do we denazify the police? Once again, here's Michael German of the Brennan Center, quote, the most effective way for law enforcement agencies to restore public trust and prevent racism from influencing law enforcement actions is to prohibit individuals who are members of white supremacist groups or who have a history of explicitly racist conduct from becoming law enforcement officers in the first place or from remaining officers once bias is demonstrated. That means establishing and consistently enforcing policies prohibiting participation in white supremacist organizations and expressions of racism by police officers, creating reliable reporting mechanisms for referring officers suspected of racist activities to internal affairs, prosecutors, the FBI, and other agencies empowered to have police oversight, smashing the blue wall of silence by encouraging and protecting whistleblowers within police departments, and hiring racially diverse police forces that better reflect the demographics of the communities they serve. So those are the three Ds. And sure, it all sounds good, but do we have any evidence that reforms like the ones I've been talking about would actually do any good? particularly the defunding and redistributing of responsibility, which seems to attract the most resistance from cops and pro-police organizations. Yes, we do, actually. In 1989, the city of Eugene, Oregon, established the Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets program, better known as CAHOOTS. CAHOOTS responds to nonviolent police calls, calls related to mental health crises or addiction or homelessness, situations which demand help and intervention, but not the presence of armed law enforcement officers. 
Cahoots responds to about 20% of all police calls in the Eugene area and has inspired similar programs in Stockholm, Sweden, and most recently in Oakland, California. The CAHOOTS program operates in coordination, not competition, with the police department. It's been so successful that, in an interview with U.S. News last year, CAHOOTS operations coordinator Tim Black identified lack of resources as the program's major problem. CAHOOTS currently has an annual budget of around $2 million, which is a tiny fraction of the budget of the Eugene Police Department. Despite those budgetary challenges, CAHOOTS has operated successfully for over 30 years. According to a paper published in the journal Contexts in 2018, approximately 25% of people killed by police in the United States show signs of mental illness. People in the midst of a mental health crisis don't necessarily need a cop armed and trained to respond to situations in terms of conflict showing up to escalate the situation, as we've seen happen all too often. There is a better way, and CAHOOTS and similar programs are demonstrating that on a daily basis. There are lots of other things that can and should be done to fix or at least improve the way we approach policing in this country. Beyond demilitarizing the police, how about disarming them? Or at least disarming cops assigned to duties where a violent response isn't likely to be called for. Civilian oversight is also essential. When cops are suspected of wrongdoing, those charges ought to be investigated by people who don't work for that police department. And there should be a place where whistleblowers can go to report abuses by cops to people who aren't, you know, cops. I'm happy to say my state of Maryland has recently taken some big steps toward meaningful police reform. Our state legislature passed laws establishing strict guidelines governing use of force, imposing criminal penalties for excessive force, requiring police to practice de-escalation, turning disciplinary matters over to civilian review boards, mostly police chiefs still play a role as well, and most importantly of all, repealing the far-reaching Police Bill of Rights, which had been an impediment to the investigation and punishment of police misconduct in Maryland for almost 50 years. As far-reaching as those reforms are, they're still not enough. And my state is just one state. Policing is a problem all across the country. Some police departments are so deeply broken that the best way to fix them is probably to abolish them entirely and build new police departments in their place, starting over from the ground up. That'd be an excellent opportunity to get rid of the Nazis and Klansmen and such, by the way. Just a suggestion. <laughs>